Ben trovati amici di The Boat Show, eh, buon anno, la prima trasmissione di quest'anno è dedicata a una regata epica, la Rolex Sydney to Orbit e con me per parlare di questa regata epica non poteva esserci nessun altro se non eh, Antonio Vettese con la sua lunga conoscenza della vela e del mondo della vela, grazie Antonio. Grazie, grazie a te Rachele. Edizione di questa regata da ricordare, ma tutte sono un po' delle edizioni da ricordare perché questa regata oceanica, questa Blue Water Race è, come dicevamo, epica. Cioè... È una delle regate della grande tradizione anglosassone, le regate di oltre 600 miglia, ricordiamo la Rolex Fastest Race. Nata nel 1925, questa è del 1945, 78 edizioni. A questa ultima hanno partecipato 103 iscritti, come sempre tanti cambiamenti di fronte e una regata molto viva, molto interessante da seguire. Parte nel 45, come dicevi giustamente tu, nove barche, ma in realtà abbiamo visto delle edizioni come quella del 94 con 371 iscritti. È una regata prevalentemente per i velisti down under, quindi Australia e Nuova Zelanda, ma partecipano equipaggi da tutto il mondo. Gli italiani sono stati spesso a Sydney, è un'impresa arrivare là, sì. <ride> qualcuno addirittura ha spedito la barca per partecipare a è questa regata bella. che come dici è veramente epica. Velocemente il percorso parte dall'arbor di Sydney, quindi dal mitico porto di Sydney, esce da The Gap, Pacific Ocean, arriva fino allo stretto di Bass per poi infilarsi nel Duart River, quindi in questo fiordo che poi è un fiume e porta alla capitale della Tasmania che è Hobart. E quest'anno questa fase conclusiva è stata determinante per decidere dopo il vincitore. Dopo 630 miglia. Il Line Honors dopo 630 miglia, pochi secondi hanno diviso il primo dal secondo e c'è stato il sorpasso finale, il risultato sembrava acquisito e è andata così. Sarà veramente interessante guardare questi, questo speciale di Rolex. E poi c'è da aggiungere che il vincitore in tempo compensato di RC è una barca molto più piccola di quelle che hanno vinto in Lana Honors, che erano attorno ai 35 metri. Spiegaci brevemente metri. Antonio questa differenza. Il Line Honors è il tempo reale, quindi il primo che arriva Ma di solito eh, sono dei maxi. Il tempo gigante. compensato è un sistema, un algoritmo per tentare di paragonare barche molto diverse tra loro e metterle insieme sullo stesso campo di regata. È un sistema abbastanza evoluto che assicura una certa equità del risultato anche se ci sono dei critici. Vabbè, quindi non ci resta che guardare questa, questo speciale, lo speciale di Rolex che è tra il sponsor dal 2002 e quindi che dire di più? Buona visione! Buona visione! The Spirit of Yachting un programma in collaborazione con Rolex. Sailing is multiple dimensions. There is no other sport in the world where you have to process all of that information and bring it together. It's one mile after the next mile. Just focus on the things that you can control. We, at some point, are going to get really hard conditions. You need to prepare yourself. Those boats are the state of the art, the three fastest 140s in the world. We're just happy to be in the mix. They say time stops for no man. Well, the Rolex City in Hobart start time at one o'clock on Boxing Day stops for no man. December 26, 2023, and it's 6 a.m. Yes, it's the start of the 78th Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. With unpredictable weather forecast, for the bulk of sailors, whether veteran or rookie, they face a long and wet ride out at sea. My name's Grant Warrington. I'm skipper of Wild Thing 100. 
My name's Georgie Salters. I'm going to be on Synquant. I'll be competing in my first Sydney to Hobart this year. Just absolutely love the Rolex Sydney to Hobart race. Uh, this is my 30th year and uh, 20 years since we won it. I'm feeling very nervous. The nervous is overriding the feeling of excitement. It's such an extreme offshore iconic event. Sailors everywhere all want to come and do this race. I've got no idea what to expect, except for some of the stories that I've heard from family and friends that have done it before. I love having my family on board. <laughs> so this year we've got my son who's 27, that's his third race. My daughter's first race at the age of 21, so uh, you know, hopefully they'll keep it up. If they don't, that's okay. At least they've tried it and, uh, you know, and been able to do it with me and that's a really special thing. Ready? Ready? Okay. Okay. My dad, he is very driven, iconic. It, even just walking around, everyone knows him and it's funny to see, but um, he's a bit of a legend, really. He's incredibly inspiring bit of a hero to many people and myself. It is a great great tradition with this race of uh, yeah being passed down sort of from father to son and, and etc but I, I don't know that I sort of live up to quite his his level but um, I'm definitely excited to be doing the race with him. I think it's possibly something that's um, I've inherited genetically this feeling that I always want to be on the ocean. Hi, I'm Arthur Saltis. I'm Georgie's dad, a helmsman and watch captain on Synquant. She's never been following the, the mainstream. Georgie's always focused on what's important and whatever that is to her. I've always loved the idea that Georgie would get into a sailing crew. She would say, Oh yeah, look, I wouldn't mind doing a Hobart race. And I just thought, well gee, I, I, if I can be a, a conduit to, for that to happen, that would be great. It just clears my mind of anything else I might be thinking about. You can't focus on anything else when you're focusing on how to sort of sail a boat from A to B. And so in that way, I find it very meditative. People spend their whole lives sailing in this race, trying to compete and win for one, one win. So if we could win a line on this anti handicap, that would be incredible. Scandia Wild Thing takes line honours in the 2003 Sydney Hobart. Owner and skipper Grant Warrington has finally done it. Well, looking back at this uh, old video from 20 years ago, uh, wow, it's fair to say I've matured a lot since then. Uh, you know, at the age of uh, 39, I was certainly a little bit more gung-ho. I think I'm a lot more relaxed now. And I, you know, look, I guess when you're uh, having children and bring them into the world and sending them off to school and uh, all the other challenges that you have in life, um, I'm pleased to say I've still got my first wife, which is fantastic. You're right, I look a lot younger. <laughs> <laughs> After many years of trying and uh, sailing on my own boats and other people's boats, it was uh, a real relief to be rewarded for all the hard work and effort. My young son Ollie there that I pick up, he looks like he's about, not very old at the time, five, <laughs> six. It's just uh, fabulous. Uh, my wife jumping on board and cracking some champagne, just uh, a real special moment. We'd love to do it again. So we've certainly had our share of disappointments as well as wins. After the win in 2003, 2004 our keel broke, we ended up going home in a life raft. 2005 we got third and we did a really nice job in 2007. We were about an hour ahead on corrected time in very, very good shape and our mast broke. We were excluded from racing one year, I think that was 2012. There was some paperwork that wasn't in order at the last minute. And I had a couple of years off and then we're able to pick up the boat we've got now, which raced last year and the year before as Stefan Racing. Now it's Wild Thing 100. Mm -hmm. 
I just could see design-wise that the boat could be optimised a lot better by making it longer. So we had some design analysis done about how we could utilise the existing boat, use as much of it as we can uh, because you know, a new boat is so enormously expensive. So we decided to modify it to make it 100 feet. So that's what we've been doing all this year. We've cut it off in front of the dagger boards, moved the bow forwards four metres, put a new section in and added two metres on the stern. The boat looks fantastic and if it goes as well as it looks, it'll be very competitive. A bit of a tough day for us today because the rest of the fleet are out doing the Cabbage Tree Island race, which is the last qualifier before the Rolex Sydney Hobart, so we're still building the boat, but that's okay. <laughs> we would love to win line honours again, but we have also positioned this boat a little bit lower in the handicap range, so we're nearly 200 points lower than Comanche, for example. So we just feel that if we had a boat the right length, then we'd be in the hunt. And if it becomes a big boat race, well, you never know, we might be able to get the double. We might be able to win on handicap, which would be amazing. Our rivals, of course, are definitely Comanche, number one, Law Connect racing incredibly well, Scallywag. If we could beat just one of them across the line, we would have had an incredibly successful year because those boats are the state of the art, the three fastest 100 footers in the world. And you know, we're just happy to be in the mix. Yachts greet the starter in the 2023 Rolex Sydney Hobart. And outside, the light breeze will move to the northeast for the 628 miles south. We're very close to the start, and we are underway in the great race. And it's Law Connect closest, getting the early jump on Andrew Comanche, while SHK Scallywag has really nailed her start at the far end of the line. You ready to tack on? Gallywag and Andrew go round the turning mark behind Law Connect, who's first out the heads. Scallywag has to tack. Andrew has all the rights. Protest! Did Andrew have to luff up there to avoid a collision? They've called protest. Wild thing has had a good start and will be fourth out the heads. Just behind the 100 feet maxis are the boats in the 50 to 80 feet range, including pocket maxis, Alive, URM and Money Penny. Many think the overall handicap honours could be taken by one of these boats. Then there's the 72 feet Antipodes, featuring navigator Lindsay May, incredibly competing in his 50th consecutive race. But after the early excitement, Andu has found her gears and she has taken the lead over Law Connect and Scallywag. Back in the pack, there's Sydney 38 Sancot, featuring the well-known Saltus family, who won overall honours on AFR Midnight Rambler in the ill-fated 1998 Sydney Hobart. I think since I was a teenager, I've been saying that I want to do this race. My dad did his first Sydney to Hobart when he was 18, and he has said I'm much more prepared than he was. My uncle and my father and my godfather were on board Midnight Rambler for the 1998 Sydney to Hobart race, and they ended up winning overall. They were in the hands of Mother Nature, as, as a lot of the other boats were who didn't have quite as lucky a story as they did. So I think it meant a lot to them to survive, finish, and then to go on and win was completely unimaginable. But it was also a very sombre moment knowing that other people had lost their lives. This is the 25th anniversary since the 98 race, and so... Georgie, if, if I'm giving you any advice into this race, is, is that at some point in 620 nautical miles heading south across the roaring 40s, we're gonna get bad weather somewhere, and 
you, you need to prepare yourself for bad conditions. All of the issues that revolve around what's going on the land, whatever they may be, just floats away. It just it literally floats away and you, you're there amongst the, the, the ocean and the, the, the wildlife that's in the ocean and uh, embrace the, the beauty of it. Si dice che la distanza più breve tra due punti sia una linea retta. Ma in una rotta nautica intervengono fattori impossibili da controllare. Venti capricciosi, correnti insidiose, onde possenti. Forze così poderose si affrontano solo con volontà incrollabile, grande esperienza e un formidabile intuito. Per perseguire i traguardi più ambiziosi, per trovare le risorse più nascoste, con passione, con furia e con umiltà. Quindi la rotta che ti porta da dove sei a dove vuoi arrivare non è mai una linea retta. Eppure il più delle volte è quella giusta. As the leading yachts head down the eastern New South Wales coast on day one, pre-race favourite Andu Comanche has taken a commanding lead over Law Connect. But the fancied SHK Scallywag has had to retire with a broken bowsprit. The fourth 100-footer in the fleet, Grant Warrington's Wild Thing 100, is struggling to stay in touch with her two main maxi rivals. My name's Ollie Warrington and I'm on uh, Wild Thing 100, uh, doing mast control and uh, making coffees and stuff. <laughs> Ollie, my oldest son, who's 27 this year, until we got this boat, he hadn't really had the opportunity to be able to do a Sydney and Hobart race. The first year when we got to Hobart, his mother said to him, so what did you think of the race? And he said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever done. I'm never gonna do it again. And then a week later he said, so what are we going to do better next year, Dad? And that's what the Sydney Hobart race is all about. I guess Dad's best advice uh, with regards to the race is to just always be sort of on the ball, like on deck as much as possible, be like ready for anything that you know, anyone needs done, just sort of stay alert. My name's Georgia Warrington. I'm the social media marketing manager for Wild Thing 100 and I'm also the owner and skipper's daughter. My daughter Georgia is 21 this year. So she's also been a sailor in the past. I'm really happy that she's decided to take the opportunity to sail in the race. We have a bit of a following now, so I just get as much content as I can for the socials, help out where I can on the boat with um, food and whatever, but yeah, a bit of a floater, I guess. What's up, Wild Thing 100 supporters? It's George Warrington here, bringing you your latest update on board Wild Thing 100. She's not scared, which is fantastic. And there's no reason to be scared. I mean, it's just a really nice feeling to have, uh, have your family on board and, and, and hopefully pass on the baton to them one day. I definitely don't see myself doing 30 Sydney Hobart races like Dad has. We'll see about two. I really just want to experience one. I think we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Anything's a possibility. The southeasterly change and savage winds expected further down the racetrack, for many of these boats, this is the calm before the storm. I'm nervous about sort of the array of conditions we could get. Nervous to see how the boat responds in different conditions that I haven't experienced yet, but I'm also excited to see the crew decision making processes and when when we choose to change sails and how we do our manoeuvres in those different conditions because it's a great opportunity to learn as much as I can. I am a little bit worried about Bass Strait. I think it could it could be quite hairy. Um, but I've got seasickness tablets for that. <laughs>
while Andu Comanche maintained a decisive lead over Law Connect on the race's second day, by dawn on day three, its lead has shrunk to less than two miles. This certainly shapes as a race finish for the ages, as the two maxis head up the Derwent River towards the finish at Battery Point on the edge of the Hobart CBD. It's neck and neck now. Which of these crews can do it in this two-boat war on water? Incredible. That's the fifth time the lead has changed. It looks like Law Connect has gained the upper hand over Andu Comanche with a last jibe just 50 metres from the finish. They stole Comanche's breeze. Against the odds, Law Connect has done it. After finishing runner-up for the last three years, owner and skipper Christian Beck can finally claim line honours. They finished in a time of one day, 19 hours, 3 minutes and 58 seconds, just 51 seconds ahead of Andrew Comanche. It's the second closest finish in the race's history. To win the Rolex Sydney Hobart Yacht Race is a dream come true, especially against Comanche because it's such a good boat and for us to, to beat them I, I thought the, the odds were very low and to actually beat them and the circumstance where the lead changed so much, it was an incredibly exciting experience all around. In this year's race, the rich have certainly got richer as the bigger boats escape the worst weather behind, which is now closed in on the smaller yachts. In the race for the overall handicap and the Tattersall Cup, Reichel Pew designed Alive wins on corrected time. Skippered by Duncan Hine, it's the Tasmanian boat's second victory in five years. Wild Thing 100 comes in over the line in sixth. A good result for Warrington, considering all the recent modifications and last minute preparations just to make the start. The first night was very challenging. There was lots of big uh, thunderstorms and, and rain clouds and we actually got stuck in a really big one um, a little too far to the west and uh, we just never recovered. That was really, a, it set us up for disaster really. I think we lost about 40 miles in that first night and uh, it was very, very hard to, to recover from that. But uh, the two big guys in front of us just uh, had, a, had that jump on us and uh, they maintained and, and then increased that lead because they stayed in the strong easterlies and we were battling around thunderstorms and westerly breeze and easterly breeze and northerly. It was just uh, all, all over the shop. Our goal was to be able to uh, you know, get to Hobart first of all, learn as much as we could about the new boat and uh, set ourselves up for the future really enormously proud of Georgie for doing her first race. She was on deck as much as anybody and uh, she kept getting FOMO when she was downstairs. I, I said, oh, it might be a bit bumpy and a bit wet up there. You may, might want to stay in the bunk. She said, no, but then I'll miss out on the action. So she's <laughs> up on the rail taking photos, doing a thing. Well, I must say there was a lot of times in one day I'm like, I'm never doing this again. And then I was like, okay, I see the hype now. I see why everyone comes back. <laughs> That's it. Last year I said to Ollie, it doesn't get any better than that. Mm. This year I can say to Georgie, it probably doesn't get much worse. So that's good. <laughs> <laughs>
Patrick Sankot in 63rd place. It was harder than I expected yet to not sugarcoat it. Um, I think there were definitely parts that were particularly bad, particularly the second half of the Bass Strait crossing and then the last oh, 50 nautical miles today, hectic. I think we had about 55 knots, not that we know for sure because we lost our wind instruments on day one, so we're guessing and there's a good chance that by the time we get to the pub we'll be saying it's 65 knots. I took particular strength from knowing that Dad was helming and steering a course that was going to get us to Hobart, particularly in the moments when I was feeling really scared and like it might not happen. Just watching the effort that Dad was putting into steering and making sure we were going to get there really helped me not lose my cool and trying to keep myself calm I knew it was important for Dad to be able to perform his best as well. First and foremost I'm a proud father and uh, really really concerned about personal welfare uh, and it was just this instinctive is everything going to be okay and so I think Georgie was sensing that and so sort of, Dad will you step back a bit. The way that Georgie managed herself was just perfect. I found it really hard at various points throughout the race. There were a number of times I was crying, but people didn't know because we had so much spray over the boat, it just looked like salt water. I think I want to give ocean racing another crack because I think I was slightly hardly done by and I want to get the more enjoyable champagne sailing conditions. Next time on The Spirit of Yachting, we're in Asia for the Rolex China Sea Race. The Spirit of Yachting, un programma in collaborazione con Rolex.